We're here tonight to celebrate the release of North Woods with author Daniel Mason. Daniel is the author of The Piano Tuner, A Far Country, The Winter Soldier, and A Registry of My Passage Upon Earth, which was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. His work has been translated into 28 languages, adapted for opera and the stage, and awarded, among others, the Guggenheim Fellowship, the Joyce Carol Oates Prize, the California Book Award, the O. Henry Prize, and a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts. He is an assistant professor at Stanford University's Department of Psychiatry. Welcome, Daniel. And I'll just tell you a little bit about the book as well. Uh, it's a sweeping novel about a single house in the woods of New England told through the lives of those who inhabit it across the centuries. A daring and moving tale of memory and faith. When two young lovers abscond from a Puritan colony, little do they know that their humble cabin in the woods will become the home to an extraordinary succession of human and non-human characters alike. An English so 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 soldier destined for glory abandons the battlefields of the new world to devote himself to growing apples. A pair of spinster twins navigate war and famine envy and desire. A crime reporter unearths the ancient mass grave only to discover that the earth refuses to give up their secrets. A lovelorn painter, a sinister con man, a stalking panther, a lusty beetle. As the inhabitants confront the wonder and mystery around them, they begin to realize the dark, raucous, beautiful past is very much alive. This magisterial and highly inventive novel brims with love and madness, humor and hope. Following the cycles of history, nature, and language, Northwoods shows the myriad magical ways which in, in which we're connected to our environment, to history, and to one another. It's not just an unforgettable novel about secrets and destinies, but a way of looking at the world that asks the timeless question, how do we live on even after we're gone. And here to tell us more is Daniel Mason. Thank you very much, Silas. Yeah. Uh, thank you for coming. You know what book it is. <laughs> there you go. Um, thank you for coming. So um, about half of you are family, so um, yeah. about a quarter of friends. About a quarter of you I don't, I don't recognize. But um, so I feel like in some ways, um, some of you have been hearing about this book for an extremely long time and have read it and have read it in very early incarnations, um, have told me what I've gotten wrong um, in terms of how I've built my buildings and dug my wells and what plants bloom when in New England. So um, I take responsibility for all the mistakes. Uh, but just so you know, a couple of people in this audience have, have really helped me uh, very much in the process of writing this book. Um, this is the first time I've read this, so it just came out yesterday. So it's a little bit of a test run, but it's kind of good to have this in a friendly, uh, family filled audience. And, um, I'll read a little bit from it and then just and answer answer questions. Um, I realized that with Brooklyn Booksmith, I think I was here for the Piano Tuner, which was my first book, which would have been 2002, um, which might have been before some of the staff was born. So if you want to know what it was like a long time ago, but I remember it was in the basement. That was uh, so it's it's lovely to be back, and um, and because this is such a New England book as well, um, kind of a, feels like a very appropriate place to, to start it. Uh, so I'll, I f I find out the book reading is like a funny genre um, because probably most of you hit. Other than my family, has anyone read the book? I'm just curious. And you you really you have read the book. How did you read? Do you, you get an ARC somewhere? They did. You did. Okay. Um, and you started it, okay. Oh, you're almost finished. Okay, we well, are very fast to read. So I'm going to work on the assumption that people haven't read the book, um, and I apologize for repeating myself for those of you who have. Um, so, so basically, the Silas did a nice introduction telling you what it's about. It's the story of a single house in western Massachusetts, um, told from the time that the house was built as a cabin by a pair of uh, Puritan lovers who absconded. Um, 
of the Connecticut River and disappear into the mountains and sort of throw a, throw a stone down onto the ground um, and, and decide this would be their home. And then each chapter that follows is the subsequent inhabitant of the house, whether human or, or non-human or, or supernatural, um, up until the present day and then the final chapter sort of going fast forward into the future. So no plot spoilers there. That's kind of all um, on the cover, I believe. Um, but so, you know, for a reading, you know, I think like if I, if I go to reading, I guess one thing that happened to me very early on, I heard Don DeLillo read, um, and it totally changed the way I read his books because I heard his voice when I read his books. Um, and it really, he just had this wonderful reading voice, and so I started reading his books in, in the sort of imagined voice that continued to stay with me for a long time. So I, so I, I think, um, I won't read a lot from it, but maybe that's something that, that we can get at it. You know, we can enjoy the genre of the book reading, um, but otherwise I think most fun for me is just to have a Q&A, so I thought maybe I'd read for about 10, 15 minutes, and then I'd be happy to answer any questions um, about the book. Um, so what I'll read from um, is the, the third chapter of the book. So the, the book, it runs chronologically, so over the course of this 350, 400 years, but then it also runs through the season, so it starts out with June, um, and then um, progresses through the calendrical year and ends up with, in June at the end. And so one of the great joys of writing this is that I wrote the book and the seasons that the book took, took place in, um, which is very different for me because in the past it's taken me a really long time to write. But there's something about kind of being in, in New England um, and each day walking outside the house and kind of seeing the world around me. And so it seemed appropriate that I read a ch from a chapter of September, since we're in September now. And what's happened up to this point is we have our Puritan lovers who've run off. They've built the cabin. Um, then uh, after that, a woman is um, taken captive um, during a French and Indian War, um, a, a raid on her, um, on her settlement. She's taken to the house um, where, she's, um, where she's held captive, sort of waiting um, with the woman who's the one of the, the female part of the couple that, that escaped. Um, something bloody happens, um, a man is killed, he has recently eaten an apple, um, and as he decays, um, the apple seed s sends out a root and, and um, becomes a seedling and begins to grow into a, a tree. Um, and at this point, I think probably another 60, 50, 60 years have passed, and this apple seedling that had once been the seed that the man had eaten is, is now a tree. And the chapter that I'm going to read from is told from the perspective of a major in the British Army who's been wounded on the battlefield in Canada and had been stabbed in the chest by a bayonet that had been recently used to cut an apple. Pretty dramatic <laughs> bayonet sound. Um, and, and so um, so he has, whether because he was stabbed by this particular bayonet or just from some other sort of fancy, he decides that he's never going to return to the battlefield again and he's just going to become uh, an apple farmer. And his family thinks this mad because he's destined for, to be a general, perhaps. He comes from a, a military family. Uh, and so they uh, hire a doctor to uh, examine him and, um, and try to convince him that he should just get rid of this um, silly notion of apple farming and, 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 re and return to war. It's written in the form of a letter to his daughter right before he leaves for the Revolutionary War. So he does eventually return to the battlefield, but um, hence the, the 18th century style, um, which I hope translates in reading, but it's the first one I've done. So it's about halfway through the chapter. It's broken into little sections, and this one is called On My Purported Madness, that's his interest in apples, uh, and the question of what is a lunatic. Take a man in perfect health and let him assert against the general opinion, and you will find such man accused of deviancy or error or madness. Such was my fate, that my sister and mother, while pretending to listen patiently to my dreams, were in fact conspiring behind my back. At that time, I was wont to wander the city, meditating on my future course, and it was upon my return from one of these rambles that I found my house mysteriously empty, except for my siblings. My daughters, Constance, had me understand, that's his sister had been taken on an excursion, which was the better, for I was to be visited by one Dr. Arknott, who had agreed to my examination at half past three. 
I had no time to object, for the hall clock chimed the half hour and was answered by an arrogant little knock. Now, if only the man had been as wise as he was punctual, both that which he flaunted as a great surgeon of the war and that which was whispered among the soldiers as Dr. Wrong Oleg. A reasonable man might, then and there, have refused him, and yet I was aware that it behooved me to pretend to cooperation. Therefore, I girded myself to suffer this idiot, and smiled warmly and welcomed him into my sitting room, while Constance ordered up some biscuits. The doctor was in a buoyant mood, having just come from bleeding, in which he had taken off three liters and seen the child return most miraculously to health. It was further proof, he said, that illness persisted because the physician did not confront it aggressively. And perhaps because he knew I was a military man, he employed the most martial language. What was needed was to launch a full assault upon my fancy, hunt down every last vestige of the offending humor as one would the most heinous traitor, and treat it. And here he slammed the coffee table without mercy. Of course, I should have walked out right there, but his imperious manner so irritated me that I became set on defying him. Bleed me, I told him, rolling up my sleeve. Ah, but bleeding was for general lunacy, he said, whereas mine was a most particular, a pomomania, so to speak, a madness for fruit alone. And he explained, there's no such thing as pomomania. That's, that, um, this doctor has invented it. And he explained that a soldier who has lain out in the field for hours will find his circulation altered by natural miasmas. Thus the spleen was tilted off his axis, and via sympathy began to the lymph, which acted on the blood, the blood on the phlegm, the phlegm on the bile, on the juice gastric, and so on, eventually imparting its momentum to the fluids of the cord. From there it was but a skip to the brain, lengthening the medulla oblongata, and tugging open the recently discovered lesser operculum, the guardhouse of the cerebrum, through which raced fancies, notions, images, and even, and here he whispered in a low voice, passions or as they say in French, passions. However, this was not the cause of my troubles. No? Dr. Arbuthnot shook his head quite gravely. After all, we all had errant fancies, notions, images, passions. Indeed, last night, while he was, well, it didn't matter what he was doing, but he fancied for a moment that his wife was his wife's sister, while well, they looked nothing alike. No, the danger was the premature closing of the operculum and the subsequent trapping of said fancies, notions, images, and passions, which like rabbits, like hamsters, like, God forbid, rabbit and hamster together, entranced by that state of such promiscuity that it might attend any shared enclosure within tight quarters, such as traveling with a lady in a warm, sultry, jostling carriage. Well, we got the idea. It was a matter of augmentation, fecundation, intermingling, producing even more fanciful fancies, notional notions, passionate notions, fanciful passions, etc., etc., etc. The effect being, well, and with a flurry and a flourish, he indicated me. You, said the doctor, this. I told him that I did not follow. Again, he began to muster his argument, but my brother interrupted. And this dreaded uh, operculum, might it be removed? Remove the lesser operculum, Arbuthnot nearly threw over the table in astonishment, and for a long time he laughed with heaves that shook his teary jowls. And he had thought he'd heard everything. We waited. Briefly, I hope my siblings had seen that this man was loonier than I. Removed. My God, no, said Arbuthnot at last. But opened. The treatment, apparently, had been worked out long before the discovery of the lesser operculum itself. The key was to coax it open with treats. It was quite fond of bread soaked in raccoon seed that had bound for three days to the udders of an unwashed ewe. One needed but to inhale the mixture and the vapors locked up behind the operculum would flee faster than a horde of prisoners through an open prison gate. Fortunately, he had a sample with him. Well, asked my sister. By then I was so relieved that he would either Bleed nor purge me, that I happily leaned forward toward the vial that he'd withdrawn from his coat. <laughs> now inhale, said Arbuthnot, deeply. For a long time I inhaled. What none knew was that I had recent, recently obtained from my daughters a most dreadful cold, which had left me entirely dysfunctional. <laughs> Around me I could see the faces of my family grow pale. There was a thump from the cat parrot cage. Even the doctor's eyes began to stream. And how will we know when the lesser operculum has opened? Coughed Kent Constance at last. But here the authorities differed. 
Laurentius described the pump of puff of smoke and Hundertius the dropping from the nostril of a little grain while the famed Antheus proclaimed, and to this belief Arbuthnot subscribed, that folly had no physical form at all. We will know, said Arbuthnot, when he no longer thinks of fruit. It's not mad to think of fruit, I said. You be quiet, said Constance. Sniff, man, said John. And I until my sister fainted. For a right old you it was. <laughs> Can't you just bleed him, my brother asked. And if you wonder why I've gone on so long about this story, it's that you might see which man among these was the ass, and recall it against any future slander against my sanity. In the middle of the chapter. On setting out and what I found. Proclaimed incurable, I was recommended to the madhouse, but my family knew well the dangers of such an incarnation to our name, so I was left to roam. For my war service, I had been given a tract of land by the fox kill, but it took only a single visit to the neighboring farms to realize it was too flat, too wet for apples. So I left the girls with Constance and set out looking for new land, and because I was already well into my fifth decade of life, and didn't have much time left for error, I decided they must seek the tree first and the land would follow. And a natural tree it must be. Many were the grafted varietals available in the nurseries of Albany, but I wouldn't have them. No pampered English import, no effete continental still reeking of the paws of some French fruitier. Mine would be wild, American. Around it, I would build my new life. And so that very month, as the carts began to make their way to village markets, I set out on horseback with Rumble, that's his assistant, at my side. And I came to realize that the country was overflowing. Scraggly crab trees grown up from cores, tossed off in roadside culverts, ranks of stately Newton, Newtown pippins, unnamed heirlooms growing in solitude in a settler's yard. yard. How profligate America was with her apples. How had I ever noticed? Less than two centuries ago, not a seed had touched the soil, and now they were everywhere, dropped by bare-armed boys with juicy chins, gentry passing in their carriages, lovers who in distant fields had hurled the cores and turned to different pastimes. They grew from pig shit, cow shit, dog shit, fish shit, sorry, there's children, sorry. <laughs> Sprung from raven droppings of the branches of the chestnuts. My God, until that moment I had never noticed. It was as if one might subtract all matter but the apple tree and still see in what the contours of the world. And I tasted all of them. For two weeks I tasted. I made my way through Albany and Ghent, across the hills and valleys between the Hudson and the Connecticut scouring markets, interrogating puzzled farm girls with my questions about varieties and soil. Twice, discovering some resplendent, solitary tree of fruit unlike any I had ever tasted, I approached the nearest hovel and made an offer for the land. Both times they refused me, for why would they ever trust this stranger with his servant lingering behind him? It was their patch, their tree, the benediction granted for their stewardship, their land. An American tree of American soil. If this was the first innovation that would lead me to glory, my second was to fill my pockets with coins and follow the children. They all had a tree, the children did. A sprawling coppice in the graveyard depths, a silver dryad with her many marbled fingers, a dell matron with long arms drooping her burden to the earth. They showed me trees with oblong red-black fruit or tight, smooth spheres as white as pearls, fruit with russeting as thick as a potato skin, around the sweetest crackly flesh. And then, far up a valley where a thin string of farms had pierced the howling wilderness, a stub-nosed boy, perhaps sensing easy prey, haggled another penny for his services, and led me on a long and winding path deep into the woods. Ah, how I remember, recall it as if it were yesterday. The thickets were so dense I had to leave my horse with rumbled. The mist was drinking thick. The path was stony, serpentine, vanishing into a meadow like an illusion, before emerging, just as illusory, in the wet cowlick of a wind-blown field. Leaving the meadow, we entered a final grove of oak and chestnut. The land rose slowly, then steeply, and at the point of this inflection, I could see a little cabin, and I readied for another settler to tell me off his land. Or worse, I thought, registering the gathering evening, the silence to which the whistling boy had fallen. Perhaps my guide had scented more than a penny to be found on this stranger, and had led me to a brigand's den. And it would end here in the dark woods, my pockets empty, a thief's stiletto in my heart. But still I followed. 
drizzle became rain. I could barely see the bounding boy. At times I had the dark parting through the ferns to guide me. I reached the cabin, most strange, this home of log and stone, with wooden beams that once had had a roof, now fallen. More ferns grew from the walls, vines curled around the broken wood, and asters bloomed amidst the rubble. But I did not have time to inspect it further, for the boy was whistling again, and I followed him past the cabin to the tree. The ground beneath was two apples deep, and they fizzed and popped as I approached. Animals had picked clean the lowest branches, and the wind was blowing through the surrounding birches. The boughs swayed. Nearby, a single rain-wet apple beckoned. I reached. It slipped beyond my fingers. Another wind. Again, the apple rose up, up higher, and at the height of its curve, it seemed to pause as if considering the worthiness of its petitioner and swung down into my hand. Thin veins of crimson ran through its spring green flank. Faint streaks of russeting, a blush that seemed to change in color as I raised it in the failing light. When I bit into it, I had the sense of tasting not only with my tongue, but deep within my palate, a scent more than a flavor, as light as lemon blossoms, before a second wave came spreading through like syrup. What in heaven was this, I wondered. An apple, of course, an apple in all ways, and yet I had never eaten an apple like this. No one had ever eaten an apple like this. Erratum, the boy had tasted. The little sandaled creature now eyeing me from where he crouched upon a field stone. I wanted to weep. I felt the forest watching as I reached up to take another apple. Then I paused. The house was empty, the ground thick with rotting windfall, and still I felt as if I were trespassing on another's bounty. So I took just four more, for Constance, for my daughter, Alice, for Mary, and for Rumbold, who must be cold and worried back on the road. Then one more for myself. It was pitch black when I reached the place where we'd started. Rain streamed over my servant's hat. Grinning stupidly, I held up the fruit and said simply, I found it. Then I rummaged in my pocket for another penny, but the boy was gone. All right, so I'll stop there. So that's his discovery of the apple tree. I'm happy to talk about the book. Now I guess answer questions or if those of you who have read it want to say anything, I'm also open to that. Or if you have an old house and want to tell about it, that's also great. But yeah. Um, so, so I missed the opening of your talk, so you might have already talked about this. Um, is the cabin and the woods like located in a specific part of New England? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so I'll just repeat the question. Um, where, so where in New England would, 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 this, would this cabin be? So it's a bit of a hybrid of various places in it's in Western Massachusetts, Southern Vermont, and, and uh, sort of Columbia County, New York, um, places that I sort of spent the time over the last couple of years. Yeah. Uh, I've just uh, gotten hold of your book, obviously. Uh, it was just a blurb, and the, the, the general uh, premise that really fascinated me. So we're so used to reading books about humans and human dramas, and it is very fascinating to think about how transient uh, we are, and you know how certain objects and, and, and things last so much longer. So uh, what, was, what was the seed of inception? Was it a particular house, a photograph, or something you had seen and then imagined lingering ac across centuries uh, that you know, would, would sort of develop into this book? Sure. Um, so that's a, a lovely question about the, the idea that inspired the book, but also touching on the idea of, um, just of transience. Um, sort of the, the, tension between transience and permanence. And so the, I began first, I think, thinking about it during the pandemic. I wasn't writing at all, just, just you know, I think like a lot of people just kind of dealing with the pandemic. Um, and I think transience was very much on everybody's mind then, um, you know, particularly acute, acutely so then. Um, and I, I had been with family um, in, in upstate New York at that point and was just wandering around the woods. And I think, um, you know, like, like you probably know from walking around here. So I'm, I'm originally from California. I've lived most of my life in California. To see a building that has a date written um, on a little plaque outside the building and advertised, it's a very novel thing for a Californian. Um, and yet, you know, one encounters it all over New England. And so seeing these and then also wandering the woods and seeing all these old walls um, everywhere, and, you know, there's, there's miles and miles of old, of old walls crisscrossing New England, you know, beginning to think, 
somebody carried all of these stones here, and the landscape must have looked incredibly different. Um, I mean, this was all deforested uh, 200 years ago. So Massachusetts has just begun to deforest more than its forest. Like we unfortunately, I think, passed that sort of un unfortunate landmark. But uh, up until very recently, it was it was this, a state and region that was reforested. And so I began to think, like, my God, this is a completely different place, and yet I have no idea. Um, and yet there are clues to be found, and there's some wonderful books. Um, that, um, there's a man book by since we're in a bookstore. That's Maybe you can find on the shelf a book by a man named Tom Wessel called Reading the Forest Landscape, which is essentially a guide to how to walk through a forest and look and and read what was there beforehand based on the clue, based on the clues who were there. And so I began to get a little addicted to this process of walking around and 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 um, having this sort of time machine um, to travel into the past. And so then then when I began to write, I just, it, it it sort of felt chapter like, right? Each of these layers, each of these strata. Um, has in its corollary in, in a book a different chapter in time, um, and so I, so that's that was the original idea when I started out. Like I think I'll, I'll write something through time. I think what I didn't know is that the stories would connect and it would become a novel more than a collection of short stories, um, and that the early chapters would sort of continue to persist throughout the the later chapters. So even though the characters are they go away in different ways, they stick around, um, and that was something that came out as I was writing. Thanks for the question. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about, since this is a book that's so related to place, um, and sort of looking back in the places that we are, um, whether it impacted how you think about climate change and sort of looking towards the future and how we steward land. Um, and yeah. Um, so it's a great question just about you know writing about the natural world and thinking about climate change. Um, you know, I think, like as family and friends know, like I love the outdoors. I love the woods. Um, I mean, most of the research for this book was just walking around, um, and I love the woods more now than I did before writing it because one of the wonderful things about writing is, as your jaw, you're, like, you're supposed to notice more, and the more you notice, the more things appear. And so, um, at the same time that I was doing that, that um, the intense pain that one feels in noticing what's going on becomes ever more acute, right? Because like I'm sort of cultivating a love for this thing, which at the same time, like every day I open the newspaper, um, is telling me um, is increasingly being lost, which is a thought that that um, I sort of put into the, the the words of the character in the second to last chapter of the book, so the last character in the book, who's a grad student, and, and she you know, falls in love with the woods. It sort of feels like, um, feels like she just fell in love with someone only to be told that that person was dying. And um, so it's very, I mean, it's very painful. Um, I wanted to write about that. It's hard not to write about, like, it's hard to not write about something that you're thinking about all the time. Um, but at the same time, I think that, uh, I think a lot of people are struggling how one actually writes about this. Um, do you write about sort of a dystopia? I mean, I think that's one way sort of approaching and imagining it. You know, at the same time, there is still a lot. There's still a lot of hope. There's still many good days. Um, and so eventually, as the book progresses, you'll see that like the history of the woods is both a narrative of like, incredible loss. Like This was all covered with chestnut forests, and those are all gone. And then you know, I cross half, you know, two dozen Elm Streets on my way here across Massachusetts, and like of course, most of the elms are gone, not all. Um, you know, but at the same time, there's still of great richness, and and so, um, you know, I tried to hold the, the two of those together while writing it. Um, so it's not just, like, I don't think of it as depressing, and and part of what I know kept me from getting too sad while writing it was engaging with characters who are all a little, many of whom are a little batty, like Charles Ogden, the the archetypist that I mentioned, um, and trying to find kind of like a, a humor in life, like like one finds when you know, one faces a physical disease. You know, people with physical can also, you know, find a lot of meaning as, as the day goes on. So, um, yeah, I and mean, that's sort of like a long and rambling answer to your question. Uh, yeah, I, had, I did an interview um, this morning, and the interview asked, like, did I hope to, you know, change climate change? I mean, it's a lovely question. I was like, you know, there's no way. I don't think anyone in this audience needs convincing that there's a problem. Um, you know, most people read the book's not going to need to be convinced. But at the same time, it, it means something to be part of, I think, a general 
um, you know, a group of people who are writing and really trying to sort of you know, just keep our attention on um, to the majesty of these places. Thanks. Thanks. Yes? I have a question. The problem in the book, but also, you know, you, if you walk in a landscape, there's some grounding that happens. Right? There's a ground you can. What's the grounding? Uh, so so uh, you mentioned the French Indian War, there's reference to it. Um, for the characters in the book, I'm curious, what is the grounding? What's the principle that grounds them to do their life? Hmm. That's a wonderful question. So, what 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 grounds the characters to, to, to the landscape? Um, that I think a, the fun a fun part about writing a book with a kind of ensemble cast like this, which which I haven't done before, um, is that each one connects very differently. And so, like Charles Osgood, this English major, um, like he he from the day he kind of commits himself to this is out in the fields with his hand dirty and he, and he has his twin little daughters who eventually take over the farm and they're they're very much grounded in the place they've come to know the place you know so much so that when he dies and his daughters take take over which is the next chapter in the book um, that a threat to their relationship to the land um, you know takes a very kind of tragic turn without kind of giving away too much of the story so the people like them who I think are very much connected to the place and really notice the place a couple chapters later there's a um, there's sort of like a Hudson Valley School artist um, who's writing in the mid 19th century, a series of letters to a, a poet. Um, this sort of becomes increasingly romantic, and um, he like completely indul like he he he's a painter. Um, who in some ways has left the sort of high life of of art to really try to focus and notice what he's seeing in the forest. And like he's someone who's aware of everything. Like he he's. He's laying on the moss, noticing you know, every single moss, every single beetle. So much so that by the end of the book, his artwork is sort of studied for this. Again, somebody who's very much grounded. A few chapters later, there's a, a sportsman who sees the place as a hunting lodge, um, build, builds a new wing, so with the dream of hosting Teddy Roosevelt, um, and is only stymied in his dream because of, sort of the persistence of earlier inhabitants of the of the house who kind of won't let this happen. But and that's not to give away too much. But 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 yeah, he wouldn't notice a thing. Um, you know, he wants to hunt it all and put it on his wall. So, so different, I think, is the is the answer to your question. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Can you uh, talk a little bit about your characters and how the process? Did you find it difficult developing characters over such a long time? Yeah. So, questions about character development, and did I find it difficult developing, looking at different characters from across time? Um, so. Again, this not having a single person who I was thinking about all the time was very different for me. Um, I don't want to say it was easier, but in some ways, like, because I knew that the chapters were going to be short, um, I felt like I could, um, I didn't have to do everything with every character. Like there, there's something about like, you know, to write like a 350 page novel about a single person, um, I'm thinking about it, you know, I sort of, as I'm writing it, I'm like imagining my editor's questions and, and he's asking, right, like, well, can you tell us more about the, his past? And what about his relationships? And what about his loves? And what about his dreams, right? And these are all great questions. But this, the challenge was a little different because they're there for brief periods in time, sort of like brief periods in, over the course of this history, uh, which actually made it a little fun. Like if, if I didn't have, you know, if, if the painter didn't have like a you know particularly interesting child, it's all right. I, I didn't need to include that. Um, but if the sisters had an interesting childhood, then I could say as much about that as I wanted to, and maybe I'd skip the part about their painting, which is a little less interesting. So, um, so, so, so in some ways, they're, they're you know it's it's always a, a challenge trying to write somebody from the past um, and not put contemporary thoughts into their mind. Um, and it's not meant to be a you know, psychological study of people from the 18th century. But at the same time, I want to get it right enough that if you're reading it, you're not thinking, like, that doesn't sound right. Um, so, um, but, but the, yeah, anyway, I hope that answers. Yeah, yes? Kind of on that. How did the Beatles? How did the Beatles? <laughs> there are children here. <laughs> how, how, was that something that you decided to have fun with? Yeah. But, yeah, well, it would be terrible if I said that was a serious job, because you'd think that was really weird. Um, 
So, so the, I think one of the goal, goals in this, as I was thinking about the book, was that I had this crazy idea when I first started out, and that I was going to write something that was totally devoid of the human. It, it's like one of these ideas that, like, you know, fortunately didn't stick around for a very long period of time. But, but at the same time, I thought, you know, the house is abandoned, the house is occupied, the house is abandoned, the house is occupied. There are periods of time where there are no people there. Um, and also, it's, it's set in the woods. It's not called North House. Like, it's about a place. Um, and so there are all these non-human non inhabitants. Um, I love writing about the natural world, but it's always been setting for me. And in, in this case, I thought, no, they're there, they're alone. And so they're going to have to take on the roles like protagonists, like regularly used for a human protagonist. Whether that means um, it's a panther um, who so returns a couple points in time through the book, um, or other, um, I would say, less charismatic creatures um, like like a beetle, who in this case is sort of extraordinary, right? Like the landscape, the profound reason, like most profound reason our landscape looks differently is because of the fungus that none of us can see and that, that kills off the chestnut trees. And the fact that a little a little beetle that has Dutch, brings the inoculum of Dutch elm disease into a tree can like change the look of every single American city is really sort of extraordinary. Um, the fun part is that, of course, they have all the same stuff that humans have, like, they have sex, they have violence, um, they, they have um, danger. And so to think about that character, that little beetle, um, from a similar sort of way, trying to give them all the kind of agency that a human character had, had was, was, was a lot of fun. So, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yes, sir. I know you said uh, you do a lot of your stuff for this book where it's walking around in the woods, but when you have to create like a voice for a specific time period, how do you go about doing the research for that? Yeah, so, so how do I try to, to recreate a voice from a particular time period? Um, and so the, like the chapter that I read this is, is an 18th century voice. There's the number of chapters that correspond to each of the months, and then in between those, there are these sort of found texts, which would have been um, like there's a um, there's a captivity narrative, there there's a true crime uh, bit, and so those are interspersed throughout. That um, you know those I try to get by reading a lot of it. So you know reading a lot of true crime narrative, you know, which is like some pretty terrible stuff. You know, like a little traumatized from writing that chapter and stuff that I had to read. Um, you know, like trying to get into the voice of these different kinds of Englishes. Um, is fun, and, and, and I think that, you know, in some ways, it's both alienating, but it's also sort of familiar, like it is our language, it's just sort of like the strata in the forest, like it's just different stratas in our language going farther back, so there's a kind of familiarity to it, um, but usually what I'll just do is I'll read it and read it and read it and read it until the rhythms start feeling kind of comfortable enough that I'll try it, um, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you said uh, on your walk you saw these like miles and miles of the wall. Like, could you tell me more about the walls? Yes. Well, so you should go see them. Have you seen the wall? Well, I mean, no, I haven't. So it's just like, yeah. Can you help me picture it. I don't. I don't know. Those of you who know New England better than I am, where would be the closest sort of classic stone walls to, to Cambridge? If you want to? I mean, throughout Cambridge, Concord. Like, okay. Um, so as you go to Concord, you'll see. But but this is true. Like as you drive along, to, like say to Connick. Parkway in New York, you see some beautiful ones, but really throughout the woods, anywhere in Western Massachusetts, yeah. I think the walls are there because it was farmland, and when they would clear the land for the farm, they had to put the boulders and rocks somewhere, right. so they would build the walls and also keep animals in or out or things like that, so they weren't, they weren't buried from someplace else. Right. They were they're, they're carried from the fields nearby. Right. Yeah. So there's this one, so this thing happens where with the freeze-thaw cycle, means that zones are sort of pushed to the surface. And so the earth is like constantly offering up, in a place where you get a winter freeze, it's constantly offering up stones. And so it makes the situation pretty tough for a farmer or a pastoralist um, who needs to clear the fields. And so they would both clear the fields, so for agriculture, um, but also to mark territory or keep animals in. And the cool thing, which is like why this, I love this book, um, Reading the Forested Landscape, is based on the kinds of stones and the size of the stones in the walls you can tell what the land was used for. Uh, and, and so, because if, you, if you're clearing out small stones, it means that probably the use is gonna be for tilling and agriculture, whereas you might leave that in the place if, you're left, if you have animals. And you can see that, you go walk around the woods and you can find big stone walls and small stone walls. Um,
but they're, once you start noticing them, they're, they're all over the place. So it's fun. Yeah. So it sounds like local audiences, the closest ones are in Concord. All right. Yeah. No. Yeah. I'd probably look in the, in the farms, because one thing that happens in the cities is like, people care for their walls. Um, and so people will sometimes fix them up. And so it's, I, I find like I'm kind of a wall fanatic now, but I'll find myself asking, like passing through like framing cameras closer to the city, like, is this really an old wall? Or is this somebody's fancy wall that's made to look like an old wall? Um, and I, if you probably can figure it out by looking at the lichen and stuff. But yeah, I think if you walk around in the woods, you'll start seeing them. Two blocks. Awesome. I appreciate the suggestion. Yeah. Yes. 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 So that's great. So, so um, cellar holes is also something else that you you find. And so um, there are houses there, and and often those are I find tougher. It just looks like a de depression. Then you realize, wait, there's not supposed to be depression here when you start looking. At were there. And it's fun to start thinking how long ago were these actually here. Of course, the really fun part is like all, you know, many of the buildings here have a similar sort of history. Once you start pulling back the plaster and imagine many of the houses that people live in, once you start pulling back the plaster, you start finding remnants of, of these old architectures. Um, it's just something sort of wonderful. I, I, there's this wonderful book on the history of New England architecture in which the author says, um, attributes this, this to the, the flinty New England character that, that, that the people in New England didn't tear things down, they reused things. And, and so that rather than knock down a barn, you would um, turn the barn into another building or you'd even drag the barn, barn across the yard and attach it to another building. So what that means is that the, the, the old bones are everywhere. So it's pretty neat. Yeah, yeah. So a family question. Yes. So okay. um, I haven't finished the book yet. So, so something different about the creative process for the first chapter. Um, so it's, the first chapter was a chapter written before I really knew where this was going. Um, and what I wanted to write, I think, and actually originally it was going to be much more extensive than it was, but um, I wanted to at least begin it with a kind of alternative American founding story, sort of rather than the Scarlet Letter. Um, it's like, you know, what happens if she escaped? Uh, and, and, and so, you know, originally that was actually going to be like the whole book. There was going to be this kind of um, magical realm off in the woods, and they would exist for a long time there. And it just felt that by that point, I sort of decided I wanted to start layering it, but, but those elements are there. Yeah, thanks. So I don't know how we're doing on time, but I'm guessing we're a couple more questions. A couple more questions. Okay. Yes. When you, uh, when you get the samples, you talked about the apples. What kind of apples were they based on? Ha, greatest question ever. Um, so what kind of apples were these based on? Uh, question from an actual apple farmer. Um, so the apple that really got me on an apple kick is called Ashmead's Kernel. I don't know if anyone's, has anyone ever had Ashmead's Kernel? No. So, so hopefully everyone here knows that there's all these apples out there like Fuji and Red, Red Delicious. And then you go off and, go away, and you stop by the highway and you'll find the people who have these incredible heirloom varieties. Um, and a friend, um, knowing that I was interested in this, just went to a farmer's market um, in Hudson. And there's this apple that he liked, which is called Ashmead's Kernel, which really looked to me like a potato. Like it's like this very, it has a lot of russeting, that sort of brown. Um, you often find just on a, on a down a dapple anyway. Um, and it's just this exquisite apple, it's just very complicated flavor. Uh, and I thought, my God, like, this exists, and I haven't noticed this, and I haven't been eating this other stuff um, <laughs> throughout, throughout my life. And so that kind of kicked things off. But, but, um, but then what was also really fun, so while you're off wandering and looking around for the, for the um, walls, is that you, 
do you find abandoned apples everywhere? And they're either uh, from, you know, some animal has dropped them, but, but odds are because mostly apples will not produce, seeds don't produce apple trees that uh, make fruit. So they will, they'll produce all kinds of random fruit, but it, the, a seed from a tree, like you planted this Fuji seed, you get something that's totally different. Sometimes it's maybe better, but usually it's not. Um, and so as a result, if you find a fruiting apple in the forest, odds are it came from some settler probably who grafted a true tree onto it. And so it means someone was there. And so sometimes you encounter these things just everywhere. Um, and, and there's just been some exquisite apples that I've encountered along the road, the best things I've ever tasted, just like in the middle of the forest. No one knows how they got there, why they're there. So unnamed locations not to be released. Yeah. What's the name of the apple again? Well, this one's called ash meets kernel. So that you can get. You can probably get that like at a good farmer's market. And it's apple season now, so I bet you could find ash meets kernel. Um, oh yeah, kernel, sorry. So it's K-E-R-N-E-L. Ash meat. is like, yeah. A-S-H-M-E-A-D. It was the name of the guy who, who, who devoted himself to it. Yeah. I know, I wish I could like bring him. <laughs> that, um, I mean, I think probably just luck, honestly. Like, I mean, in some, in some ways, I had a year of fellowship, um, for which I'm eternally grateful that, like, gave me open amounts of time to write, and so I think that helped a lot. I think in some ways, um, the structure of it and the, and the, I didn't know where I was going, which I think helped a lot because it made it fun. Um, but that's a great question that I wonder about because as I'm starting something new, I had this question in my mind. It's like, is this experience going to be the 14-year experience, or is this, the, this experience going to be the more enjoyable one? So, I don't know. I hope it's enjoyable too. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I think we're set. So, thank you for coming. Everyone's really fine.